So yeah, good evening, guys. Today we have with us uh, Shashi Mitra and Mansi Smani of BSMS 2021 to present the next talk of the space mission series. It will be on Mars 2020. Yeah, so hope you all have fun here today. Shashi and Mansi can start. Um, all right. Uh, hey guys. Uh, so, bas so basically, the big, uh, the basically the thing that we have to try to address here is, ever since 1960s, we have been continuously sending missions to Mars over and over again, and at this point, we have sent a lot of missions, uh, but still we keep going there. And one of the and one of the latest and the coolest of the missions to Mars was Mars 2020, and we are just going and in this presentation, we are just going to talk about that. Uh, so yeah. Right. So that's as Shashi mentioned, we have sent a lot of missions to Mars. Why did we need to send one again in 2020? What was the reason, and what did we hope to achieve? So uh, the first one is obviously looking for signs of life. This has been one of the major motives of most space missions for a really long time, and after the success of Curiosity. Uh, we have found a lot of signs which point to uh, the presence of water on Mars, which, uh, which again makes us hopeful that there might be some signs of life that we can find. And that is one of the major missions of Perseverance. Uh, second is to characterize the climate of Mars. Uh, so uh, the Perseverance rover has a, has, this, has a weather station on it, which allows it to record not only the temperature, the humidity, wind speed, a lot of other weather characteristics to be able to see what, what exactly is the climate of Mars uh, and so that we can have a better idea of the environment of Mars. Third, again, characterize the geology of Mars. This is, uh, it has been an important part of astron uh, not astronomy, but space missions over, uh, made the moon, uh, the one we sent to moon, to Mars, Venus, I, any of those. But we have been uh, specifically interested in looking at the geology of all of these uh, uh, celestial bodies. And this is also something that we uh, aim to achieve through, Persever uh, through Mars 2020. Finally, and perhaps the most interesting and exciting um, uh, goal of Mars 2020 is to prepare for human exploration of Mars. There's a lot of technological advancements, advancements or experimentation that will be done on Mars through this mission. Uh, perhaps the production of oxygen for the first time through uh, on Mars environment, or the characterization of climate, like I mentioned before. But all of these are geared towards preparing us and helping us understand what we need to do to be able to prepare for human exploration of Mars. Uh, all right. So, based on, so Mars 2020, uh, like the mission name itself says, the mission was launched on 30th July. 30th July in the year 2020. So bas basically, there is every year there's a small window where uh, a launch to a um, launch to Mars is going to be like easy, and uh, and the, and it's uh, it's around the time of July. So that that's when uh, that's when Mars 2020 had launched in July 30, and it was launched from it was launched from NASA's launch site Cape Canaveral uh, Cape Canaveral on the rocket Atlas 541. Yeah. Right. So as you might be aware, going to Mars is not exactly easy. It's not just you should uh, launch and reach there. You require a lot of trajectory correction maneuvers to ensure that not only is your uh, spacecraft going in the right direction, but it'll also be uh, reaching in the right place to be able to re uh, land and the, in the uh, where you exactly want it to because all of these missions have specific landing sites that have been selected for specific reasons. So the first uh, trajectory con uh, correction maneuver, or TCM, the first two of them done on August and September of 2020 were basically to point the spacecraft towards Mars and to fine tune its flight path after launch. Uh, the third one was perhaps uh, one of the most important ones, and it was done uh, 45 days before landing, which is called as the approach, uh, which is the 45 days before landing is when the approach of the spacecraft towards the uh, towards Mars actually began. And it was done again to ensure that the spacecraft was traveling at the right speed and the right direction to make sure that it, that it is 
that it, when, it re, when it reaches Mars, it will be in the correct position to land in the correct, in the correct landing site. Uh, last, the last two were again, last two TCM4, not last two, but the TCM4 and TCM5 were again done to just refine the flight path. They weren't in fact necessary, but they were just done in case there were any uh, issues. And TCM5X was actually a backup maneuver. So there were, uh, so the spacecraft actually had eight thrusters, which were all active and in, in all of these TCMs to ensure that there was, that the a spacecraft is going in the correct direction and TCM5X was a backup maneuver and that was just a backup fuel in case it was required but it was not actually required and it's, it was a backup maneuver as such. And the last uh, was TCM6. It was a final contingency uh, done on the very day of landing to ensure that it was in the right position. And that gets us to landing, that gets us to the landing of day of landing and when the rover actually landed. Uh, all right so the rover la rover landed in <clears throat> sorry the rover landed in the jezero crater in in a region that is called the isidus planitia on mars and so you might you might have heard a lot about how uh, the rover I mean, how landing on mars would have a, is is normally referred to as 7 minutes of terror so base so basically what so basically what ha what happens is okay so when you are sending a signal to and okay so any signal to and from uh, mars is going to take about 12 minutes for for this to be for it uh, for it to reach earth now now the issue with it is it's going to take 7 minutes for 7 minutes for the, for any spacecraft to from to go from the top of the atmosphere to the to the surface so, so you can just imagine uh, the uh, the rocket, I mean, the spacecraft reaches the atmosphere of the Mars, uh, atmosphere of Mars, and it releases a signal as it go as it goes to land. By the time that signal, by the time that signal is received here on Earth, it would be on the surface for five minutes, and you would not know if it was alive or if if it was alive or dead. Now, now the now the actual name of the now seven minutes of terror is more like an informal name, and it's actually called entry, descent, and landing, or EDL. And so, base so basically, first we enter the Martian atmosphere. The thing the thing with the Martian atmosphere is the atmosphere is not so th okay. Atmosphere is not so thick that parachutes can uh, parachutes are going to be. Parachutes can do the entire job, but it's not. But it's not so thin that the the atmosphere is going to cause issues during entry. Yes. and and so basically, for so the first step is um, okay. So basically, the first step. So the first step here is to just enter the atmosphere, and first you are just dealing with all. First you are just dealing with the heat of entry. You will have immense, you'll have immense uh, friction. You'll have immense friction and air resistance. And now, and so, for, so after a while, it first deploy, and then after a while, it slow. Once it slows down a bit because of the, I mean, once it comes, uh, once it comes closer to the surface, rather, it deploys its parachute, where, and the parachute starts uh, solving. Uh, the parachute starts slowing down the uh, spacecraft. And once the once the parachute is deployed, you can you can release the heat you can release the heat shield. And while and while the parachute is still slow, slowing your still slowing down your raw spacecraft, the spacecraft is going to look uh, look through radar to basically look through radar and look at the terrain and try to figure out where, which place would be the best. Now the Martian atmosphere is is extremely thin compared to the Earth's atmosphere, so the parachute while it is helpful it is not terribly effective so at a, after a point <coughs> sorry after a point you are going to have to so after a point you will be deal, so after a point the parachute is not going to be effective anymore so the, there are rockets built there are literally rockets built on built onto your there are rockets built onto the spacecraft uh, in on a separate on a smaller module and then this and then the rockets are going to slow you, slow you down, and slow you down a lot more. 
and then and then the rover is lowered with, with the help of a rope called with the help of a rope called the sky crane and uh, the parachute is let go the the rockets uh, basically help you with the power descent and with a with a rope you the rover is let uh, rover is let down and gently placed onto the surface and the and the landing uh, and the landing module with the rockets that thing is just going to fly off and it will impact somewhere else uh, okay we have a question we have a question why satellite follow like curved paths and why not why they don't prefer straight lines all right uh, i think you might be referring to the path over here uh so so basically earth okay earth itself is going uh, okay earth uh, earth is going to have uh, earth is going to have some ang uh, angular momentum right so when it is uh, earth is going to have some angular momentum and when it, when you just leave and you just sorry when you just when you leave it from earth it is still going to be affected by the sun's gravity so you have to account for that and the best part accounting for the for the velocity when you leave earth's gravity when you leave earth's gravity and dealing with the sun's gravity and also dealing with the, the position of mars and how it changes over time curved paths are much more efficient than straight paths i hope that makes sense in all right yeah that is okay and i was like asking like when it has entered the mass why we don't allow it to like free fall from the top uh i mean it is it is essentially free fall okay uh, the okay the path okay the path depicted here it's okay it's not going to come it's when it's coming towards mars it's not going to be pointing straight towards the surface right so you can't exact you can't exactly like <clears throat> sorry when it's coming this when it's coming towards uh, it's not going to be pointing straight towards the surface for one thing and when it's uh, when it's coming that when it's coming at an angle you have okay basically when you are when you are free falling the gravity is only going to affect the y component of the velocity so the when the when the spacecraft comes when the spacecraft comes with a large larger component of a larger x component of the velocity you can it's easy to slow down the x it's easy to slow down the x component than y component so having to deal less with the y component uh, means it'll be easier okay i mean if it's point if it's pointed straight okay if it's pointed straight and it's moving at say 1000 if it's okay the velocity is 1000 km per hour if it's pointed straight towards the surface and it's on a straight path then you are going to have like okay then the gravity is okay then because of the gra gravitational force the 1000 km is going to be accelerated to a much higher number if you if you have most of the velocity i mean if you have less velocity in the y component Uh, say 100 kilometers that is much, that is going to be much easier for the parachutes okay for the parachutes and the sky crane to deal with the deal with uh, when you are trying to cancel out the effects of uh, gravity compounding 100 kilometers per hour and 1000 kilometers per hour all right so let's okay uh, so now let's just try to look at where the rover landed so this is this is just a small sort of map of the surface of mars and where the different uh, major missions uh, to mars landed and this and you can see where and you can see where the jezero crater ha is now jezero crater is basically a crater within a crater so basically there was an ancient meteorite meteorite that hit the surface of mars and that was called the acidus planitia and this and the and that formed the base now the jezero crater the jezero crater itself was uh, uh, was formed by a more recent uh, meteor hitting on top of that crater uh, so one of the previous missions to mars which was an orbiter called the mars reconnaissance orbiter it had an instrument called crism now this was able this uh, did a scan of the surface and it found that there was a lot it found that there was a lot of uh, clay in this uh, crater and aside from that there is a bit of there is evidence of uh, river flow over here but why but why did we have to go to jezero crater in the first place so clay so so the first thing to think about is clay as found in jezero crater it can be formed only when there is a presence of mars 
now when you look when you try to look for similar rocks of clay on earth uh, specifically it was okay specifically the mississippi river i mean mississippi river delta then the then you can find microbial life embedded within the rocks so that so that is something that you are trying to look over here and aside from that based on the structure of exactly where the based on the structure of exactly where your mass mass uh, I mean, perseverance had landed you can you can see that the you can see that it is it heavily resembles a river delta and and uh, and obviously river delta you can expect a bit of bio uh, you can expect higher chances of life forming in the river delta and aside from so so the place is a great candidate for life to have existed aside from that the rocks here could be as old as 3.6 billion years old so not only is the place a great candidate for past life and any evidence is going to be well preserved as well uh okay so the first so the first two months on mars uh, so basically so it la so it managed to la it landed in feb it landed on february 18th on the sur on the surface of mars and most of february was basically taken up by testing the equipment it land uh, so and obviously it, when you are tossing something onto another planet's surface and it is undergoing ex such extreme forces you just want to make sure that all the components are working and the rover and the rover was uh, for first moved for the first time on 4th march of 2021 and the next day uh, the site landing site was named as uh, octavia e butler landing now if you know if you haven't heard of this person's name octavia e butler she was a really she was a really popular science fiction author who had won multiple hugo and nebula awards and she was i be if I'm, she was the, the first sci-fi author to get a macarthur fellowship now and then ingenuity was deployed on april 3rd and the same night uh, i mean same martian night uh, the first rep weather report from mars was taken mars was taken for the night of 3rd and 4th april now on 19th april the first test flight of ingenuity and the first test of moxie was on uh, april 20th sorry and this uh, this is basically the uh, small video of the first I'm sorry this is basically a video of the first time uh, the rover moved and i hope you can hear the audio so we managed to find so mars 2020 was one of the was the first uh, mission with a microphone on it so you do you can hear the audio as as it moves on the surface of mars okay and as for the route travel as for the route travel i'm sorry. sorry okay as for the route travel it uh, so it started here at, yeah it started here at the octavia e butler landing and then okay and then so it has basically has two science campaigns so the first science camp so the first science campaign it traveled along these yellow lines and so basically say so seta is basically a place that is uh, extreme it seta is basically a, a region filled with sand dunes and uh, crfr it's basically short for crater floor uh, which is roughly fractured and that was where the first sample was taken Right, so now that we have an overview of the mission, let's talk about the actual components of the mission. One of the most important components of Mars 2020 was Perseverance, which was the name of the rover. Uh, so this rover was about, as you can read, its chassis was about 10 feet long, 9 feet wide, and 7 feet in height. So this is comparable to about a small compact car, which can also be seen in its weight, as is around 1,025 kilograms. It's actually uh, much lighter than a small compact car, but I think it gives you an idea of what a rover this size would look like moving on the, on the surface of Mars. So let's talk about its legs and its wheels. It, it has around, it, its legs are ba rather basic, made of titanium tubing. And what is really interesting is that they're very powerful and allow it to drive over rocks, which are about as tall as 40 centimeters, which is pretty impressive for a rover which is, uh, which is carrying such delicate science equipment. Moreover, its wheels are made of aluminum and they have cleats uh, 
for traction and curved titanium for springy support. One of the most important things about such a about the wheels is that they have learned a lot from Curiosity. As Curiosity was the last rover sent to Mars, it uh, it faced a lot of wear and tear on its wheels because of the rough surface of Mars. So it found itself stuck in a. Uh, it's important to know that Curiosity found itself stuck in a football field around a side sand trap. So to uh, so, so it learned a lot of lessons from Curiosity and made made perseverance perseverance's wheels rather sturdy and rather bigger in size as compared to Curiosity. I think it's really uh, one thing really important or rather interesting to note is that the rover can turn 360 degrees in its own space in its own position due to the help of its legs and its wheels. Right, so one of the most important things about any rover sent for scientific mission is its camera, because that's what, where you'll be collecting most of the data. So the number of cam, uh, so there are 23 total cameras on Perseverance, which is five more than Curiosity. And there are three different kinds of cameras, as you can see here. Uh, there, so there are three categories, which are descent imaging cameras, engineering cameras, and science cameras. So let's first look at descent imaging cameras. Right, there, again, there are two different types of descent imaging cameras. The entire purpose of descent imaging cameras was to take pictures or photographs or, 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 and even videos while the rover, while the entire uh, rover plus descent uh, stage was landing. So there, there are, let's first look at the EDL, which is the entry, descent, and landing cameras. These were used to document the entry and the descent and the landing, of course. There are four of these, uh, four of these types of cameras. The first one was the parachute uplift camera, which was present which was present on top of the uh, on top of the descent stage to be able to look at the parachute and its uh, these were, there were four of these uh, four of the parachute uplift cameras and they were present on top of the descent stage and they had a clear view of the parachute and the Martian atmosphere while the entire setup was landing. The second is the descent stage look down look camera present on the bottom of the descent stage and it had a clear view of the rover and the Martian surface. While the, uh, while the sky crane was landing. The rover uplook camera was present on the rover, looking up towards descent stage and the parachute. And the rover downlook camera was present on the bottom of the rover, looking down at the Martian surface. So as you can imagine, the setup of these entire seven cameras gave, gave, the, gave NASA a really clear look of the entire, of the entire mission uh, landing, landing procedure, the entry, descent, and landing procedure of the, of the space mission. Uh, the second kind of descent imaging cameras are the land and vision, lander vision system cameras. These were really critical for the rover's safe touchdown as they took pictures of the surface while the rover was landing and compared it to the, uh, to the present data that we had about Mars's topography to be able to determine which spot exactly was safe for, for landing so that the rover didn't land on any rocks or anything that was unsafe making the mission a failure. Now let's look, have a look at the second type of cameras, which are the engineering cameras. So again, there were three types of these cameras, the hazard avoidance cameras, or the HAZCAMs, the navigation cameras, the NAVCAMs, and the cache cam. So the main purpose, the main purpose of the main job of the HAZCAMs and the NAVCAMs is to be able to uh, look around the rover to help in its autonomous navigation. What's really interesting about Perseverance, especially as compared to Curiosity, is that it is uh, capable of much more uh, navigation as compared to Curiosity by itself. It requires less interference from, the, from NASA, NASA or other scientists present in NASA, and it can actually plot its own path through the Martian surface. So the HASCAMs and the navigation cams, HASCAMs specifically, are mounted in front and at the back of the rover, and they look at the rocks and the uh, topography of the Mars surrounding the uh, rover and plot a, a safe path th through its surroundings. Uh, the navigation cameras are located at the top of the rover around the mast. And these, this is actually, these can actually, this one, in fact, there are two of these, and these can actually look a spot of something that is the size, size of a golf ball from a distance of 25 meters. So as you can imagine, both of, a combination of both of these is very important for the rover's uh, traveling and navigation. The third one, the cache cam, is actually very specific. has a very spe specialized function, which is that it, uh, 
it takes a picture of the rock samples collected uh, by the rover so that the NASA scientists can have a look at what is being collected in real time and see uh, what was the process and what, uh, how exactly and which exact, which exact samples got collected. And this is, it's more of a scientific camera, but um, it has nothing to do with navigation. But again, it is a really important camera. Uh, one of the important things about engineering cameras was that they all had very similar camera bodies, but different specialized lenses, depending upon what job they were doing. Lastly, let's come to the science cameras of the rover. There were four of these, and they were actually very important. So first, let's look at MastCam Z. Uh, this camera is a color camera, which is uh, capable of panoramic and stereos uh, stereoscopic imagery. It is actually the, uh, one of the major cameras, and this is the camera where, uh, which will be capturing most of the pictures, will, which will be seen by us, as it will be capturing the environment of, uh, of Mars, the topography, and stuff like that. SuperCam is actually a combination camera. It, it is more geological, uh, it is more for the geological side of the mission. It comes with a spectrometer and a rock vaporizing laser, and, uh, and obviously a combination camera to be able to see what kind of rocks are present and what soil is present. And uh, actually, I will come back to this later during the microphones part. It's very interesting, and I would love to talk, talk about it. Let's now go to the rest of the two which are Sherlock and Pixel. So uh, Sherlock and Pixel are actually present on the robotic arm of the rover. And the uh, Sherlock is, can go really close to the rock samples that are being collected to be able to see what kind. Uh, it, it also has a spectrometer to be able to. So it, its entire purpose is to be able to see what kind of composition is present in the rock, and specifically the organic molecules present in the rock. Again, similar with Pixel, it's also present in the robotic arm to be able to see what kind of what is the composition of the rocks. In, instead, it just uses an X-ray fluorescence uh, spectrometer to be able to detect very small scale changes in the composition of rocks. Uh, let's now go to the microphone spot. Yeah. So as Shashi mentioned before, uh, there are two microphones on the rover, and this is the very first space mission to carry a microphone with it. So it's very interesting to be able to hear the sounds of Mars as they term it. Uh, the job of the microphones is obviously first to listen to the wind, to the uh, to, uh, to be able to document the weather of Mars. But more than that, um, something uh, as you might be able to read in the third point, it says it's very important to determine the hardness of rocks. So this this comes uh, brings us back to a super cap. So what, what it really does is that it's present next to the SuperCam, and the SuperCam has a high vaporized laser. So the laser is used, uh, is used to target the rocks and vaporize certain sections of, of the specific sample of rock. What this helps us do is that there is a pop that is heard while the, rock is, uh, while the laser hits the rock. And this pop is recorded by the microphone and the difference and the difference in the sounds made by different rocks can help us determine what is the hardness of rocks. So again, it's very interesting and very important for the NASA scientists or any scientists in general that are listening to this, that are recording this data, listening to this data to be able to see what is the geology of Mars. Other than that, the job of this mi of these microphones is to listen to the wind or also listen to the rover while it's working to be able to see to be able to understand if there's any issues with the mechanism or if there's something that needs to be fixed. Uh, other than that, there are also something called the EDL mic mics, or EDL is again, entry, descent, and landing, as we talked about before. Uh, these EDL mics are, uh, were used to listen to the sound of the descent of the rover and the descent stage. Uh, again, to um, supplement the entire experience of watching the rover landing on the surface of Mars. Uh, all right. Since we are on the topic of sounds from Mars, uh, so let's just let's just think about how sounds from Mars are like different from sounds on Earth. So obviously, Mars has a different uh, Mars has a different atmosphere, temperature, density, blah 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 blah. So obviously, the sound is definitely going to be different. So it has it not only has a lower density but lower temperature because of which the speed of sound is going to be slightly slower. So on a round speed of sound is around 340 meters per second but on mars it's going to be around 240 meters per second 
and now this now volume of anything you hear will be lower on mass because like you have it's of the air over there is of lower density about a hundred times less dense than it is on earth so so basically if, if you are listening to some okay if you are listening to something from extremely far away <coughs> sorry and then aside from that the sound quality is also going to be the, I mean, aside from that the sound quality is also going to be different so basically so what's going to so since atmosphere of mars is most about 96 percent carbon dioxide which would basically absorb a lot of higher pitch sounds and only lower pitch sounds will be able to tra travel extremely long distances so be so because of these conditions i mean so you can just imagine how the sounds from mars will be different from the sounds on uh, sounds here on earth Right, now let's come to the robotic arm. This is uh, the, the last part of the rover's uh, composition. And it's actually very interesting because uh, it's different from the robotic arm that was present on Curiosity. And because of these differences is the main reason that uh, Perseverance as a rover is around 100 kilograms heavier than Curiosity because of the specialized functions of this robotic arm. So this robotic arm is around seven feet in length and it has five degrees of, of freedom for movement, which is very fascinating because it has tiny joints that let it move around as you would pr perhaps move your own wrist. As I mentioned before, it contains uh, cameras like Sherlock, Watson and Pixel and also a ground contact sensor and a drill. So what's, uh, the drill is perhaps one of the most important parts of the, ro of the robotic arm of Perseverance as it allows uh, the rover to be able to drill out sp certain sections of rocks and preserve them inside its, inside its body. Uh, the, uh, by, by the, while the drill is in motion, the rover will gather and store these cores in tubes on the Martian surface. I think... Uh, well, while it's while it is being stored, one of the major uh, one one of the most ambiguous parts, in fact, of this mission is that NASA currently has no plans to retrieve these samples that are being stored in Perseverance. They're not quite. Uh, they do, in fact, want to uh, retrieve these samples to be able to study them properly, as it is said that no, uh, as it was said famously by someone that you can't actually understand Mars until you have a hands-on experience with the kinds of rocks it has and the kinds of and what and what kind of geology it has but they are planning some sort of a mission where they'll be able to go and retrieve the, uh, these rocks and get, get them back to earth to be able to study them properly in fact NASA and ESA might be planning something where ESA sends in another rover ESA is of course the European uh, Space Agency uh, sends in another rover where uh, which will launch its own small uh, rocket launcher to uh, to retrieve these samples and uh, launch them out of the Martian atmosphere, uh, which will then be collected by a probe and brought back to Earth. However, e even though the uh, the certainty of the samples being collected is not very high or it's it's quite uh, the it's quite uncertain, it's still a very important step that, is be, that has been taken by NASA or this mission to be able to collect the uh, actual samples of the geology of Mars to study personally. All right, uh, but okay, so you have so many cool stuff, uh, so many cool stuff, so many cool cameras and experiments on Mars, but how are you going to power them? Uh, Mars, okay, as you know, Mars is ex extremely dusty, and it, uh, Mars is extremely dusty, and it's farther away from the from from the sun. So the so solar panels are going to be generally less effective, and you don't really have a good way of cleaning the solar panels, uh, as you know, as you might know, Opportunity, the rover Opportunity faced that faced that exact issue. Uh, <clears throat> so, by, so so what mass 2020 does it is it uses a different method of uh, powering itself called re radioactive uh, sorry, radioisotope thermoelectric generator or, sh or sh for short rtg so basically what rtg does is uh, when when any nuclear fuel decays it's going to use, it's going to sort 
it's going to generate heat and this heat you can and you can use this heat <coughs> and the seebeck effect to generate electrical power now when you are looking for a when you are looking for something like when you are looking for something like that when you are sorry when you are looking for some uh, radi something to decay radioactively you will need to look for some proper the fuel is going to have some prop important properties sorry Um, yeah, sorry for that. So basically, the fuel is you are looking for a few important properties when you when you see the fuel. So you are going to look for something with a with a long half life. So the amount of uh, the amount of heat it generates is not going to is not going to reduce over reduce over uh, reduce very quickly, and it should be able to generate a large amount of heat per unit volume. So don't forget that you have to take this you have to take this thing to another planet. So the lighter the thing is, the better. The lighter the thing is, or the more ener the more efficient the thing is, the better. And the radiation should be in, in alpha waves because that is most easily converted to heat. So given all these given all these conditions, plutonium two two thirty eight, curium two forty four, and strontium ninety are common candidate isotopes for uh, the candidate type to isotopes for RTGs. Now. Now, one thing you do need to keep in mind when you are using RTGs is that they are constantly generating energy. So during the so when a, so when it's going from Earth to Mars, you can't uh, you cannot turn off the you can you cannot turn off the power power generation and heat generation module during that time. Or you can't even you can't even uh, turn I mean re reduce the amount of power it generates. It's always going to generate uh, the same amount of power. So and you need to and so you'll have to figure out a way to like dissipate that heat when you are on the way to Mars. Otherwise, there's there's nothing there's nothing to directly get rid of the heat on. There's there's nothing you can directly transfer the heat onto when you are moving it, and too much heat can cause some problems. Now the RTG module on Perseverance it can it is capable of generating 110 watts of power. But this number you can expect it to reduce uh, by a few percent e year on year because uh, obviously the radioactive uh, I mean radioactive substance is, substance is going to reduce as it decays, and this power is used to recharge two lithium-ion batteries, and these two and these two batteries and the RTG module together they these two batteries and RTG module all together they are capable of. Uh, I mean, the, they are capable of basically supplying three, three fifty watts of power at any given at any given time. Sorry, a maximum of three fifty watts of power. Okay, sorry. Now, now March twenty twenty, it carried a lot of technology that was mostly like technology demonstrations or first first time experiments over there. And one of the most important, uh, and one of the most important of these is called the mass of mass oxygen S2 experiment, or short for MOXIE. So, Martian atmosphere basically it has an extremely high um, concentration of CO2. And so, basically, what MOXIE tries to do is it, it tries to do electrolysis, and and it splits the CO2 into carbon um, oxygen and carbon monoxide. If we, are, I mean, if we are trying to set up a base on Mars, it's probably a good idea to figure out a way to like figure out a way to have ox have oxygen from the resources uh, resources on site. Now, this is obviously going to be a extremely electrically demanding process. So, a norm, so a normal humans, a normal settlement of two humans is going to require uh, is going to require two kilograms of oxygen per hour. And that and that is going to take 25.1 kilowatt hours uh, of energy. And the the Moxie unit on the Moxie unit on Percy is just is a smaller in scale, and it was designed with to keeping in mind only 10 grams of oxygen of generating only 10 grams of oxygen. Uh, and despite despite that, this took 320 watts of energy, while the Percy could supply a total of 350. Now. 
now they now there's i mean you don't have direct access to any liquid over there and transporting liquid and rockets is generally a bad generally a bad idea so this so what uh, moxie does uses is uh, something called as solid oxide electrolysis solid oxide electrolysis and it basically has a it basically has a module that will basically suck in the air suck in the cold air from cold air from the surroundings and uh, it's it's generally preferred to run in the morning when it has a when the temperature is around 0 degrees celsius or 270 kelvin around okay and then it's it's going to just pull it in pull it into the pull it into more into the moxie module and over and once inside it's going to heat it up sorry okay actually sorry right and once inside it's going to heat it's going to heat it up and it will it's going to heat it up so that the solid oxide electrolysis can occur with more ease and and it's going to just check if and it's then going to just check if it's been able to if it's if it uh, generated the if it generated oxygen or not and then it's just going to cool down the it's going to cool down the gases and it'll just carefully release it into the atmosphere now the uh, now the first run of mock the first run of moxi on april 19th uh, 2020 it was able to generate about 5.7 grams of uh, yeah on april 17th it was able to generate 5.7 grams of uh, sorry 5.37 grams of oxygen in its first test on april 28th sorry sorry yeah now ma so and then you have another and then you had another piece of equipment called the mass environment dynamics analyzer or in short meter now basically the basically the purpose of this is to make weather measurements such as wind speed direction humidity it's basically a weather report for the surface of mars so based so basically on mars dust is going to affect everything from chemical processes to temperature on martian surface so this is just going to measure uh, among other things so this uh, tries to measure the amount the amount and size of particles on the martian atmosphere and also knowing the we- knowing the weather is going to help you understand uh, how the weather is going to impact the rover so if you have so if the ro- so if the weather is going to like have cause issues for the rover you'll know how to take corrective measures aside from that you it is also going to measure the radius a uh, radiation it will uh, the surface of mars is going to experience so um, among many things uh, the mars twenty twenty mission is a uh, science of life or basically fossils the fossils are going to de- degrade because of radiation so if we understand how how this radiation is contributing to the degradation will be a bet will be able to better and i mean better uh, make better predictions on what the fossils will look like and what exactly should be and then the biggest and the biggest head most headlining of i'm sorry and i will pause this and the biggest headlining feature of the ingenuity was uh, okay and the biggest headlining feature of the mars 2020 mission was ingenuity uh, so ingenuity was be, was literally the first powered flight on another planet now it is to, okay it is to be noted that it is not the first flight uh, the, that credit would go to the soviet uh, mission vega which managed to deploy it what is basically a hot air balloon into the atmosphere of uh, venus uh, and that's again another interesting mission that uh, i'd recommend you guys to read into ingenuity was the first powered flight on another planet it has a mass of about what sorry it has a mass of about 1.8 kilograms uh, so just for context it is your laptop is probably heavier than that or if you want a bear, if you want a more reasonable uh, comparison uh, the two books of hc verma together come out to a mass of 1.6 kilograms so this is about the same mass uh, so it has an onboard battery of about 35 to 40 watt hours again that is sim- that is uh, slightly lower than what most uh, laptop batteries are these days most laptop batteries come around 40 to 50 watt hours 
and it okay and also and obviously among so obviously the ingenuity it's basically it's got a small computer on it and it has a onboard processor which is uh, the qualcomm snapdragon 801 uh, just for just for context it was not too long it's not too long ago that uh, mobile phones used to ca- come with the exact same processor so that's interesting the rotor speed the rotor speed it goes around 2400 to 2700 rpm and it can achieve a maximum altitude of 12 meters and it has a theoretical maximum range of 625 meters not basic statistics so what so basically what there are so when you are trying to put something better when you are trying to fly something on mars there are going to be a few challenges so one good thing is that it has got uh, a much lower gravity than here on earth but on the other hand you have an, you have an issue that uh, the atmosphere is extremely thin the atmosphere on the surface of mars is like around 100 times less than the uh, atmo- I mean, 100 times thinner than the atmosphere on earth as which is about equivalent to the atmos- earth's atmosphere at a height of around 30 kilometers so so because of because of that you have to like you have to spin the propellers much 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 faster over there to gen- to generate lift but <clears throat> but don't forget if you want to fly it or if you want to fly a helicopter on another planet you have to get the helicopter there so it needs so it needs to it needs to go into a rocket <clears throat> it needs to go into a rocket it needs to survive the entry descent landing and all of that which is like extremely high g forces and stuff so it needs to be really sturdy and it also needs to be extremely lightweight so that the costs of launch are not ridiculous and so so like that's that's why you might that's why the entire mass uh, sorry that's why the entirety of ingenuity is like 1.8 kilograms most co- i mean most quad quad copters that you build are probably going, going to be around the same mass and okay now it's it's got an extremely thin atmosphere it uh, but uh, so it has the motors have to spin extremely fast but because of because it's spinning so fast it's going to the motors are going to heat up 1 degree every second so because so because of that uh, you you don't want to heat up the motor too much so you can't really fly the you can't really fly the <clears throat> sorry you can't really feel fly fly the uh, Space, uh, ingenuity for more than 90 seconds realistically now there's going to uh, now there's going to be 12 minutes of delay between any command sent uh, sent here on earth and that being executed so i uh, so ideally you have to automate the entire flight and that's why they used a moderately powerful processor like the uh, uh, snapdragon 801 and obviously to uh, assist with uh, to assist with that automation of flight you have gyroscopes accelerometers camera altimeter inclino- inclinometer and all of that uh, just for context move just for context you have simpler version of versions of uh, all of these uh, sensors on the sensors on your phone uh, so yeah ingenuity is basic ingenuity is basically a mobile phone on another planet which is light which is like which has got propellers that's the fun way to think about it so why why do we even have to send ingenuity like what's the point of trying to fly something on another planet so first and foremost it's a technology demonstration you can better plan out future missions now not all places are uh, so the so like like mentioned earlier curiosity was curiosity got itself stuck because stuck because of uh, in in the sand over on the martian surface not all places are going to be accessed accessible to a rover a uh, rovers can't easily uh, rovers can't easily move over sand move over sand or it can't easily go over ridges uh, and aside from that rovers are going to be like ridiculously slow uh, the 10 in the 10 years since curiosity has been operational it has traveled just 27.14 kilometers and in the <coughs> sorry and and opportunity throughout its time on mars it's it's traveled only like 45.16 kilometers and in and about in, in the about one year that the perseverance has been on uh, 
Mars. It managed to it managed to travel some on somewhere. I think it was about four point uh, something. I don't remember the exact number, but it was around four point three kilometers. So uh, so obviously it's going. It's extremely the rovers are extremely slow and they can't reach everywhere. So so if you look, so allow me to go back a few slides. Uh, over here in the in the route travel, you can see this place called the Seta. Now Seta is basically a Seta Seta. It's the dunes of Seta are basically extremely extremely challenging for uh, a rover to travel just because of just because of the the, the soil being so loose. But in uh, and it's and it's not even in even surface. Now, Ingenuity's programming it assumes that it assumes that the surface is flat, so it did have trouble navigating over SETA. But it managed to navigate, which is a lot more than you can say about, uh, which is a lot more than you can say about the rover. So, so, so being able to fly something on another planet, also uh, like I mentioned, uh, like I mentioned over here. Uh, like I mentioned over here, Perseverance traveled about four kilometers in the one year that it has been there. But uh, in the Ingenuity, it has a maximum range. It has a theoretical maximum range of six six twenty five meters. It can cover the same amount of distance over like it can cover the same amount of distance under a week. So that's that's something. So that's something to look forward to. And where can we see technology like this uh, again? Uh, so NASA has a mission called the Dragon Flight Plan, which is basically a mission to the Saturn's moon Titan. Now this is expected; it is expected to be powered by uh, uh, radio. Is uh, expected to be powered by RTG, and it's going to be a quadcopter, unlike you know, it's to better suit the atmosphere of uh, Titan. So it's better to send a quadcopter there than it's better to send a quadcopter than a monocopter like Ingenuity. So basically, the idea for this is to fly and explore the surface of Titan. And now, since it's going to be on a, from an aerial view, you are you can see it. Uh, it's going to be able to take surface scans from angles that uh, angles that uh, only a satellite can take, but at a much higher resolution. So it can give you a perspective that rovers really can't. Okay. And this is expected to launch in June 2027. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, so yeah, this so this is like one of the many missions that NASA has planned, uh, which try to, uh, which try to like take a look at all the technology and stuff from past 2020 and try to implement imp implement them realistically. Uh, so yeah, and with that, yeah, done. thank you. If you guys have any questions, you can. A question is she go on like as you are told like, how will this uh, sample that will be bringing back to the earth like which they have collected in the mars right so as i was talking about that they currently have no plans to bring them back they do want to and the projected timeline for when if it does come back to earth is somewhere around 2030s so even after 2030 somewhere in the mid 2035 or something like that uh, but uh, they have no plan. They didn't make any concrete plans when they did send the rover. But they're thinking maybe they're planning a mission with ESA, where they will send another rover with a lo uh, with a rocket that will go retrieve the samples and send them back, uh, and then launch out of the Martian space where it will be caught by a probe, any probe, and brought back to Earth. Is that does that answer your question? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, before the next question, I just wanted to interrupt and see uh, if you can hear an audio right now. This is uh, this is actually audio captured by the Perseverance, and it is the actual sound of Ingenuity flying on Mars. Right. There's uh, anyway. a low hum in the background. That low hum is Ingenuity's blades. Um, yeah. Shreyas. Yeah. So you mentioned that Ingenuity has the ability to fly uh, autonomously. 
and uh, you mentioned that these guys uh, the they uh, got uh, hazard cameras and navigational cameras so does the rover also have similar systems and uh, i mean are they algorithmic based or uh, no. more machine intelligence based right so the hazard cameras and the nav cams are based on the rover and not ingenuity and yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so they are uh, yeah they are algorithmically based so it will compare the terrain surrounding it and then based on what it sees it will plot a path so a lot of it is ai based agreed okay so even that can uh, do those things sort of without uh, any in the inputs from nasa yeah uh, without so any input from it NASA. prefers to not have any input from nasa or any of any uh, ground based uh, personnel it will try to uh, plot its own path but should there be any issue so should it may not be able to find anything or perhaps there's too many obstacles then th there is an option for the uh, ground based scientists to interfere and perhaps drive it manually so i mean obviously you are going to feed in the starting and i mean starting and the ending coordinates and we'll just try to figure out its way on, on its own yes yes that's course, not that's not really complicated it's a predetermined path but the nitty gritties of the path are it can decide by itself yeah and uh, that's not really complicated technology and we do have uh, lots of versions of it available here around right i think there's another question priyanshu yeah i have a question but for that can you open that slide uh, when the rover was landing uh, the right. rover landing i think 7 minutes of tell yeah just a second uh, this one yeah okay. yeah so like when the rover was landing like they use some rope train system right yeah yes so like uh, can the sky descend or oh, sorry can that uh, lander directly land and the rover slide out like why they use that train system okay so this was basically a, a, as if you know, might know something called a soft landing right so there is a something above called the sky crane so that has thrusters on it and the rover is attached to it through ropes so the uh, rover was carefully is kept on the ground as you can think of it because the rover itself has no thrusters nothing to help it fly so it was uh, the sky crane was flying it uh, it uh, it was going against the gravity it placed the rover the ropes were cut off and then the sky crane flew away oh, okay so means i mean in this i mean in this mission they don't had a lander i mean like uh, uh, no there was like in the moon missions yeah for this there was no for this there was no like stationary ground based lander from which they rolled out but i do believe there are previous missions where a similar thing did uh, happen yeah thank you i got mans right okay any other questions and uh, just pointing out uh, in case i did uh, the audio you can hear right now that is uh, the actual audio captured by the mics on perseverance uh, of the martian atmosphere uh, so um, yeah if there are no other questions i think this would be a great place to wrap up right uh, thank you everyone for coming to our talk yeah thank you for joining i hope you had uh, as much fun as we did making this presentation yeah so hello and yeah thanks guys it was like a really really good presentation your presentation style especially was super good as well as the additional effects and efforts you guys put into um hope everyone enjoyed the session and uh, if you guys just want to go through it again it this will be put up on our youtube channel so go check that out also you can find an article about this on our instagram page in the following 2 3 days so yeah if there are no other questions or clarifications i guess we can end it yeah now thanks again mansi and sashi Uh, thank you to you too for giving us the opportunity
Yeah, cool, cool. I guess then we can end the session. Yeah, have a great evening, everyone.